finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to give a huge congratulations to each and every one of our graduates. And we celebrate all that you have accomplished. And most importantly, you know, Tiffany and I today, we look forward to the great plans that God has in store for your life. So we celebrate you today. Tiffany and I are not with you today, obviously, and uh, we're doing a wedding we're here with a, a couple in our church. And so we're away this weekend, uh, but you're in good hands. I know you're already having an awesome service and we're gonna continue in our series, Armored Up. It's been awesome. God's speaking to people right now, and you're in for a real treat today as we talk about the helmet of salvation. Our Connections pastor, Mike Galliano, is going to bring a great, powerful word to you today. Come on, let's give it up for him right now as he comes to share it with you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor. I feel like I can talk to him. Like, thank you. Praise God, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Uh, guys, I am fired up today. Like I was fired up. Yes. Thank you, brother. I was fired up in first service. I'm even more fired up in second service. I'm so fired up that I wore this tiger shirt. I had you know, somebody in, uh, as soon as I got in, somebody looks at me and they're like, oh, tiger. I was like, Auburn? I said, Old Navy. I said, so this is the Old Navy Tiger, not the Auburn Tiger, guys. You know, I'm sorry. But yes, look, I'm wearing this because I'm fired up, y'all. And I just, I wish I had a lion, but this is all I could find. You know, we're talking about spiritual warfare and fighting, y'all. And I wanted to come best dressed, y'all, in my attire. Because this is a fight. We're going to be talking about the struggle. And I am ready to get to it. Are y'all ready? You ready to fight? Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, when Pastor Jason and Tiffany asked me to share this word, you know, you're speaking on the helmet of salvation. And this doesn't oftentimes happen to me whenever, you know, I'm asked to speak or to share a word, but this happened to me that same Sunday that I was asked to share a word. I was driving home, and as soon as I was driving home, guys, just doing my regular thing, the Holy Ghost came over me in such a powerful way that I, had, I just couldn't stop weeping. Like, I just, I just started weeping and weeping, and I heard the Lord say, I'm sending Timothys. He said, I'm sending Timothys, I'm sending Timothys, and I was like, okay, what does that mean? I'm sending Timothys that Sunday, I'm sending Timothys when you speak. And I said, okay, Lord, there's Timothys, that's a young person, right? He was a leader in the church, uh, and I didn't really get it until this morning when the Lord woke me up again at 5.30 in the morning. Look, that's a big deal for a father with four kids, <laughs> all under the age of eight, to wake up at 5.30. Parents, hello, on your own. So Holy Spirit woke me up at 5.30 in the morning, and I go downstairs as silent as I could be. I didn't want to wake up the kids, right? And I go down, y'all, and I just start weeping again. I start weeping again, and then the Lord brought a specific group of people to my heart. And he said, these are the Timothys I'm sending this today. And it was our students. It, I had completely forgot that it was grad Sunday. And so what are the Timothys for our students that are still here today? Uh, Timothy represents Christ in a Christless society. Timothy was young, but he was bold. Timothy represented Christ. He was light and salt to the world in a Christless society. And so my encouragement to our students here today, I, I was like you once, right? And I remember this moment. I know y'all looking forward to this, right? Like we throw this in the air and you're like, woohoo! 
this season of, of life is over, but can I just encourage you with one thought before I even get into the messages? When you throw this up, we throw this and we, we symbolize that this old season has been done, the new one is coming. Right? But can I encourage you from a spiritual sense? God has entrusted you with some things. Your parents have entrusted you with some things. They've deposited some fruit inside of your life. So even if you throw this up, don't throw away the very thing that God has entrusted inside of you. Take that with you and let this moment, whatever is new, take it with you because you are Timothy in this generation. People talk about Gen Zs or our millennials, and I've heard the conversations, they're lazy, or they don't do this. Can I tell you something? You are chosen. You are called. You are a chosen lineage, Gen Z, millennials. God has called you. God has appointed you for this time, and you will make a difference in this generation. So carry whatever God has entrusted you. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Come on. Woo. Well, let's pray really quick, guys. And, and it just, if you want to clap, clap. Look, y'all, it's okay. It's okay to clap in church. Amen. It's okay to praise God in church. It's okay to say amen in church. It's okay to say hallelujah. It's okay to say glory to God in church. If you can say it in any other place, this is a place that you can say it. If you can't say it when you pump a gas, say it here, you know? If you can't say it at work for whatever reason, this is the place where you can say amen. And all the saints say, amen. come on. So we're going to pray over this word. And I'm just going to ask the Lord to take this word that is spiritual and that he would divide it in whatever way that he wants to. Because there's so many new faces, there's so many spaces and things that are happening in your lives. And I just pray that God's word would be just so appropriate and timely for your life today. So Father, I thank you today, Lord, for just the blessing, God, to be a carrier of this word. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given me just this opportunity to be your mouthpiece, Lord. God, may I decrease so that you would increase and I pray that your word, God, which is the spiritual word of God, would not return void. I pray that it lands into tender soil and tender hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus over this environment, Lord God, that it would be conducive, God, to the word of God. That this environment right here, Lord God, wouldn't land, Father God, in deaf ears, Father. In fact, in the name of Jesus, whatever is in a spiritual environment that may be of an obstacle, that may be of a hindrance, that may be, God, just clouding the imaginations or somebody from receiving what you want them to receive. In the name of Jesus, I speak to that thing and I say, be gone. That this home, that this place is a space where you can move freely. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. I see so many faces today, y'all. This is so good. Especially, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't know. I know it's been just a, a really unique year. We have families that are now returning back to church that haven't been at church in a year. So if that's you, thank you so much, guys, for being a part of God's family here. I know you've been watching online, but I am glad you are with us today. Um, some of you guys I know, some of you I don't know. But I want to just take a moment and introduce myself a little bit and my family. Uh, I've only been here at Christ Community Church since November 2019. I know that sounds like two years, but right, I came in November and then March, COVID happened. So that was barely enough time to really start to get to know families. And so I'd love to just introduce myself again. My name is Mike. I'm the Connections Pastor here. Um, I am a husband to one. I'm a father, a proud father of three boys, but I am a daddy to one sweet little girl who just had her first birthday last week. Can, can I show y'all my little girl here? Hold, hold that. Doesn't she look like me? I am so proud of that, y'all, because, you know, I got three boys, and I've gone to places where I've gone in the mall, and people are looking at me like Amber Alert, you know, as I'm walking around. Like, these are my kids. Let's show them the next one. Oh, look, I don't care how hard you are, what you do, 
You could be a zookeeper and you're taming lions. That's an all right there. Come on. That is my little girl. I am so happy to be her daddy, y'all. I can say, well, girl dad, hashtag, right? But Monday, this past Monday, we just celebrated our little girl's birthday. And my wife decided to make a smash cake for her. You know, parents, if you know what that is, it's a cake that is made just for the purpose of being smashed. Like, you know, and, and this smash cake, she made a little strawberry smash cake and this cake, half of it ended up in her hands. The other half of it ended up in her hair. And I mean, she didn't really even eat this cake. It was more of just like what you do with Play-Doh. You want to make that sound just like. <laughs> and so she was enjoying that. Um, and it was a wonderful, normal day that we celebrated, guys. But then Tuesday came around, Tuesday came around, and uh, that Tuesday I get an alert on my phone, and it said this, get gas, attacks on a pipeline, cyber attacks on a pipeline. I know some of you guys got that as well. And I'm one of those people that I would rather be ready than sorry, right? Like, I don't want to do something or I don't want something to happen and then I'm sorry that I wasn't ready. Like I over-prepare than under-prepare. I, like I look at situations and I'm 10 steps ahead of things. Like I'm the guy that goes into restaurants, right? And I have already scanned every criminal, every person, anybody that's going to attack me, where they're going, because I need to see what's in the horizon. I'm the guy that if I'm in a scary movie, if I'm in a scary movie, I'm going to make it out alive. <laughs> Why? Because I'm the guy that if my friends invite me, they're like, hey, man, we're going to this haunted mansion or let's go take a walk in the woods. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. You guys can go. End of movie. <laughs> that is me, right? Like, that, you're just not going to get me. I'm overprepared. And I went to go get the gas, but, you know, there was just something about this day where I just felt really just uneasy, right? And I tried to do my normal routine, my rhyme, my rhythm, and I just felt like something was off and then like something was just going to go down that day. So I get home and later that night I'm just reading the news and I came across an article in bold letters that read something like this and I just want to read that. It said, and it was dated April 2021, so this is just recent, America suffers six consecutive weeks with a mass killing. Indianapolis, Indiana, four killed, one injured. Ackworth, Georgia, eight killed, one injured. Boulder, Colorado, 10 killed. Essex, Maryland, four killed, one injured. Orange, California, four killed, one injured. And in that moment, I felt like the weight of 2020 and 2021 just fell all over my shoulders. It fell all over my heart and all over my brain and it reminded me of this last year and a half of the social unrest, the riots, coronavirus, elections, uh, community violence, and now cyber hackers and, and gas shortages. And I sat in my room and I was just in a funk. I was just in a, an emotional daze, y'all. And, and why am I sharing this with you? Because I really just believe that the climate of our nations, my friends, is fragile. I believe that the climate of some of our communities that we're a part of is fragile. And I feel like the climate right now of some of our families, truth be told, is fragile. And I know many of us want to portray ourselves from a position of strength. We're a nation of strength. We're a community with strength. We're, you're a family that is strong. But I think if we were really honest with ourselves, we would say that some of us feel like we're just holding on right now. But the culture of the first century church was also fragile. And it was a culture that was hostile towards Christians, Christ followers. There was social discrimination. There was per persecution. There were public displays of violence. People were just holding on. And here's the thing. What do you do when life gets turned upside down? Like one day it's normal, then the next day it's not. And then no matter what you try to do to try to get it back to normal, it just won't go the way you want it to go. You see, Paul the Apostle had sent a letter 
to the church of Ephesus. And we've been studying this letter for the past few weeks. And this letter had some real serious implications, y'all, about Christian thinking, Christian thought, but also Christian living. It's not just what we know, it's what we do with what we know. So allow me to provide you really quick with what life looked like or what life was perceived by outsiders of the faith in the first century of the church. Because the early Christians experienced ostracism and misunderstanding like you would have no idea because of their religious language and their practice. So this was taken from a Christian magazine, which there's a letter from Pliny the Younger, and he was a governor in what is now known as Turkey from AD 111 to 113. And so in a famous letter to the emperor Trajan, he described how the early Christians lived. And so this is what he said. This was his report. They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return the trust when called upon to do so. Okay. And when this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again. So they would do this and they would do it again. And then to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. Now this order of worship seemed harmless, but it was these very practices in the words that they used to describe them that earned the church social stigmas. Let me explain. The Christians who met together often referred themso- to themselves by language that we use, brothers and sisters, right? Somebody walked in and it was like, hey, Brother John. Hey, Brother Marcus. He says, Sister Sue, how you doing? This is common language. But this confused the outsiders. Sometimes these brothers and sisters married each other, leading people to believe that Christians condoned incest. Furthermore, they worshiped Christ as God, but they denied the existence of the Roman gods. So this earned them the title of atheists from the pagan neighbors who regarded Jesus as just merely a man. Finally, they ate food together as brothers and sisters, and this was ordinary and innocent, but they talked about partaking of this thing called communion, the body of Christ, and drinking of his blood. So think about that. The Romans thought that Christians were incentuous, atheists, cannibals. And this only fueled their suspicion that Christians were traitors and menaces to Roman society. This is how they viewed Christ's followers. But in light of the times and the culture, Paul writes this letter. And in this portion of the letter, Paul instructs Christ's followers that if you're going to navigate these struggles of life, if you're going to be in this culture, you got to put on the armor of God. And we've put on a belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness, shoes for peace, a shield of faith, and today we're going to learn about the helmet called salvation. See, a soldier's helmet protected the brain from injury caused by enemy attack. And the helmet was a crucial part of the soldier's defensive and offensive weaponry. I say offensive, right? Because it's, right, if it was me, like, if I got to attack somebody with my weapon, I'm just going to throw it right at you. But it protected you as a defensive weapon. And this was so important to the soldier because if the brain was damaged, it immobilized the soldier from functioning in the way that he needed to, to fulfill his duties. So if this part of our being is damaged, it hinders us from functioning as a good Christian soldier in the way that Christ intended us to function. There's something about this right here, that mind, that God is, we need to protect this. We need to guard this because if it's not guarded, it's going to affect your ability to function in the way that Christ wants you to function. Okay. So Paul is not speaking about protecting a physical head here, 
but he is talking about protecting the mind because what the brain is to the body, the mind is to the soul, the person. And the brain in a scientific sense is the control center for the body. But the mind is the control center of the person. And in the mind, this is the place, it's the hub of all of our thoughts. It's where data is stored, and it is the place that gives signals to our actions. We do because we think. We, we don't just do. It, there starts in a place right here. And so this is a remarkable, remarkable understanding in the first century, given the scientific tools of the time. You know, Paul didn't have scat, 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 CAT scans or MRIs or whatever technology available to us today to come up with this. So under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he concludes that this is so crucial because this impacts both our thoughts but also our behaviors. But listen to this because Paul gives fair warning that this area needs to be guarded at all costs. Why? Because it's going to be attacked Fair warning, it's going to be attacked. Attack from who, you ask? Thank you. Well, let's find out. Point number one is we got to know our enemy. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a, a quote that's accredited to a French writer that says that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist. He wants you to believe that he's not real. Just a figment of the imagination. That was 2,000 years ago. That's dated knowledge. It wasn't dated knowledge here, friends. And it's not dated knowledge today. Paul makes it crystal clear for Christ's followers. And he says this, you have an enemy. You have an enemy. Look at your neighbor and say, you have an enemy. But your enemy is not the person that cuts you off in line at the gas pumps. It's not your spouse. Your enemy is not your kids. Sometimes it feels like it's the kids, right? <laughs> but it's not my kids. My enemy is not the government. My enemy is not the pastor. Paul is clear who our enemy is. His name is Satan, the devil, and he tells us that he is scheming. That word is so important, guys. When you look at, at the word scheme, a scheme is a large-scale attack or a plan. Think about this. It is a premeditated plan against you. So listen, there's one thing that if you're scheming against me, it's going to hurt. Like, you were thinking about hurting me? Like, you've been thinking about doing me harm? But, but think about it this way. What if he's scheming against my spouse? The enemy is scheming against your children, parents. Now, that just changes everything. I'm a big boy. I'll be okay if you hurt me. Well, I'm not that big, but, you know. I'll recover. But do harm to me, I'm fine. Do something to my children. Come on. Tiger, tiger comes out. You know, like, put the Rocky music in the background. Let's go. You know, like, that's what's happening. Do something to my kids. But this is exactly what Paul the Apostle was saying. He isn't just scheming against you. He is scheming against your families. What you thought was just your spouse might be just an influence from the devil's schemes. There might be something in the background or at work that isn't just what you see in front of you. 
Well, I'm going to preach. Here's the thing. He is also not doing it alone. He's organized them in such a way that he is ready for battle. Let's look at this. Rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces. That sounds organized to me. So he's ready for battle. Question is, are you? Friends, are you? Are you ready for battle? I, I hear some yeses. I hear some am- hey, Christians. Are we ready for battle? Okay. See, I, I remember years ago, and, and I know it may not look like it, but I used to play sports, right? Um, <laughs> But I used to play football, y'all. Was, what position? I know y'all big guys are like, what's he going to do, right? <laughs> I was running back. I was special teams, tight end. Not because of my size, but my speed, y'all. Like, I had speed. Like, these little legs could go. And they went. But one of the things that I used to do also was... <laughs> I used to wrestle, y'all, too. One of the things that I would do is that I would wrestle. And um, my coach, my coach, <laughs> uh, when you make yourself laugh, y'all, praise God, you got to have fun. But one of the things that would happen is that my coach would uh, do these reels, right, before we would go into the game or before we would, you know, before I would wrestle. And I'd see these reels of my opponents, right? And during these reels, I'd be able to watch and observe. I'd look and I'm like, oh, okay, that guy shoots from his right leg but he's weak on his left. Oh, er, you know, every two seconds it goes like this, or I got to cradle him like that. You understand, Zach, you were a wrestler, right? And, And so this was just preparation for the match. This got me ready before the match even happened. Satan has been preparing for a very long time for this battle. And he's had a lot more time than you and I. Warning, what we're talking about today, take it. Catch up. If you've been spiritually in a place where this has just kind of gone over your heads or you've been sitting in church and it was like, oh, that was a good service. No, get this. Spiritual warfare is real. But what we're going to do here today, guys, is we're going to expose the enemy. We're going to prepare you and we're going to equip you to battle well. Amen? Amen. Let's look at who this enemy is. Who is Satan? Word tells us in John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. Why? Because he is a liar. The devil is a liar. And he is the father of lies. Not only does he have children that are are lying, but he reproduces lies because he is the father of lies. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan. What does he do? He deceives the world. You thought you were exempt. He's trying to deceive you too. The same way that he was trying to deceive the first century Christians, he's trying to deceive you. 2 John 1, 7, for deceivers have gone into the world. Remember, Satan is finite, but he's got followers. He's got spirits that are going out into the world, oppressing, influencing. Now, he can't be in all places. Let's not give him that. But he's got influence. 2 John 1, 7, the spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Wait a second, these demons are teaching now? How was that? These demons are teaching. Okay, let's go on. First Timothy 4.1, be alert and sober-minded. This is Peter, and because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's creeping. He's waiting. 
He's watching. You ever see lions hunt, y'all? You, you know they don't just come at you straight, right? They watch you. Hello. They watch. They wait. They look for vulnerability and weakness. And at the right time, they jump. At the opportune time, when you turn your back, they jump. But why does he target the mind? Why does he target the mind? Because your mind, my mind, is the part of the image of God where God communicates with you and he reveals his will to you. Look at Colossians 3, 9 through 10. Do not lie to one another, brothers and sisters, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge. Knowledge happens in the mind according to the image of the one who created him. Romans 12, 2, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing, let's say it together, by the renewing of our, by the renewing of our, by the renewing of our, why? Here's why, so that we, so that the pastor can tell you, so that I can tell you, so that your spouse can tell you, no, so that God can tell you what the will of God is. God himself, so that you have access to the Father to know his will for your life. And that is a beautiful thing. That deserves a hundred amens. That in this moment, guys, you have direct access to God Almighty. Come on now. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. God wants you to know him, but he also knows, wants you to know his will. So God renews our lives by renewing our minds, and he renews our minds through the truth of God's word. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. With so many ideologies and philosophies in the world, guys, doesn't it feel like you're just, you're feeding on sand? One day you believe this thing and the next somebody just changes it up on you. One day it looks like this and then the same philosophy is like, oh, you just changed your mind. But, but here's the beautiful thing about God's word is that God's word is timeless. God's word is proven. God's word is true. And God's word is relevant for today. Amen. Amen. But if Satan can get you to believe a lie then he can begin to work in your life to lead you into sin. So I'm going to ask my uh, volunteers to come up here in a second. You know, science has discovered so much, so much about the human mind. Uh, did you know that the human mind thinks, like we think between 40 to 70,000 thoughts a day? That's a lot of thinking. But half of those thoughts are negative. But come on up, guys. Got my volunteers. Thank you, gentlemen. Our minds can store facts. They can store impressions. They can store emotions. They can even recall, guys, smells. You can recall these things years later. Like, I, I can go back into my mind, and uh, just a year ago, guys, think about when I was sitting in my mom's house, and my mom was making some gallo pinto with arroz con frijoles, and, okay, that's my superpower, y'all speak Spanish, right? <laughs> <laughs> but y'all know, my, where are my Latinos at? Y'all in the house? Okay, y'all so loud. Come on. <laughs> But I, I can really recall being at my mom's house and, and, and me tasting that rice and beans, y'all, and then she's putting the cream, and I'm like, mm, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I can go back to those moments, and I'm sure that some of you guys could recall experiences of moments in your life where just like, you know, I remember what that felt like. You know, I'm going to help you all out, husbands. You remember when you met your wives? Why are you all so serious? 
I was trying to help you all out. Okay, we're done. We're, we're good. But I remember when I met my wife, right? Like, I remember what I felt. I remember what she was wearing. Like, here's my wife right here. Like, I remember going into youth ministry and seeing this girl preaching. Like, this girl was preaching when I met her, right? And she was wearing, like, this pink shirt. And, I mean, I tried to approach her, but she wasn't having it. But that's okay. Because I got you now. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's worth some shouting. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right. Let's get back to this. <laughs> But the human mind is so powerful, guys. It reaches back into our past through memory, but it also reaches into the future through imagination. And leaders, we call this also vision, right? It's a very powerful place. But this is also an area that Paul is telling us that we need to guard because there is so much happening here. And this is the one area that Satan really wants to attack. He has, but he has a tactic that he's used for a very, very long time that he continues to use to deceive and to lie to Christ's followers. But today and in this moment, we're going to expose that and we're going to prepare you because you're not going to go through this again. Okay. It comes from Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 7. We know this as the fall, right? Adam and Eve in this garden, hanging out, chilling, having a good time with Jesus, but one day, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the garden, in the middle of the garden. And if you must not touch it or you will die, you will surely not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and knowing evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, but she also gave some to her husband. Sin doesn't want to function by itself. Sin always wants to bring a friend along. Right, so let's break down the enemy's tactic. First part, and I have my, my friends up here. And so for a second, I just want you to imagine with me that this space right here, this large space, uh, is your mind. Some of y'all is like this space, but we're going to imagine like this. I'm kidding. All right, this space up here, this is your mind. And what's happening is that the enemy wants to throw these fiery darts in, inside of your mind, and they're kind of floating in this space called your mind. So we need you guys to act like you're floating. There we go. Let's float, guys. There we go. They're floating in this space called your mind. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The first thing that he did was he questioned God's word. Where's question? He questioned God's word. Say right here, question. He questioned God's word, y'all. He said, indeed, has God said that? He, so here's the thing. He did not deny that God had spoken. He simply questioned whether God had really said what Eve thought he had said. Perhaps you misunderstood what God said. That was Satan's suggestion. See, you owe it to yourself to rethink this moment, Eve. And isn't it worth noting that Satan is also questioning God's goodness? If God really loved you, he wouldn't keep something from you. He tried the same approach with Jesus in the wilderness. If you are God's beloved, why are you hungry? So if Satan did that to Jesus, Jesus is God, what makes you think he won't do that to you? The second thing that he does is denial. So he denied God's word. You surely shall not die. Denial, where are you at? Okay. And so what starts to happen in the human mind is that we have questioning and denial and they become friends. So question and denial now start to take up space inside of your mind. And they're moving collectively in this space called your mind. You surely shall not die. See, this is but a short step from questioning God's word to denying it. Here's the interesting thing about Adam and Eve is that they had never seen death. 
So what do they know? All they had to go on was God's word. And guess what? That was enough. God's word is enough. That's what it, all across the room, God's word is enough. Amen. Lastly, what he throws in our minds as they're just hanging out together, substitution. He substitutes with his own lie. Look at this. You will be like God. So, substitution come together. So, question, denial, substitution eventually led to sin. That is the reason why you and I are here today. Because of this. So stay right here with me, guys. He substituted with his own lie. You will be like God. Here's the interesting thing about that moment is that Adam and Eve were already made in the likeness and image of God. But Satan tempted them with an even greater privilege to be like God or to be above God. So what do we do, Christ followers? What happens when they're floating around in our mind? Most of us will allow this to stay in our minds. Some of us feel this, aside from the 50% negative thoughts that are floating around, this is just three fiery darts. All these other thoughts that are floating around and they're wrestling for your attention and they're wrestling for your actions. They want to lead you some way. What do you do? Here's what we do. Come on, hold on a second. You're going to stay here. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Come on. So when these thoughts are coming in your mind, don't let them flow. You say, in the name of Jesus, you got to go. Get out. Thank you, guys. Come on, church. Don't let them stay in there. Don't let them. Don't get into a wrestling match with the devil. In the name of Jesus, you got to go. Any lie is obviously not from Christ. It's not from the Holy Spirit. Any thoughts of de deception or not, they come from the father of lies. Second point, it is finished. It is finished. See, Paul tells the church, put on a helmet called salvation. He gives this armor a name and it's called salvation. So what is salvation? What is salvation? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 9. And there's a lot of scripture here today, guys. But here's the thing is that it doesn't matter what I say. But it absolutely matters what God says. It absolutely matters what God's word says to your life. I can talk to you until my face turns blue. But the power in your lives is not in what I'm saying to you. It is in the word of God and how you apply that to your life. So he says it is finished. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich, meaning he's not lacking anything. There's no poverty mindset for God. He has more than enough for all of us. There's more than enough of God to go around everywhere and beyond this room. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. You were in the state of deadness. You know what dead means? Dead. Yeah. If you're dead, you're not alive. But it says he made you alive in Christ and raised you up with Christ and seated you in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That in order, in order, in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressing his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So he did that for a coming time. That was for a future time. 
what Jesus did then, he knew that it was going to be effective for the now. Come on, that was good, y'all. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Salvation, my friends, salvation is the work of God that sets us in right relationship with God and with one another. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. But salvation came through who? Salvation came through who? Look, let's look at Titus 2.11. I love my, my Christ followers in here. Y'all were already ahead of it. Came through Jesus. Titus 2.11. Let's look at this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all the people. So grace appeared. Look at that. Like grace showed up. When there wasn't anything there, all of a sudden grace came into the room. And grace had a name. And it gave salvation. So grace was a person. That person was Jesus. Look, let's look at uh, John 129. John the Baptist the next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. John the Baptist was just doing his John the Baptist thing, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son. Baptizing, go. Baptizing, go. But then all of a sudden, he gets distraction because there was something in the horizon that took his focus off. And he looked, and this is what he said. Behold, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. He looked at what was coming, and he said, that's the one. It didn't come from Elijah. It didn't come from the prophets. This is the one who can do it. This is where salvation comes from. It is Jesus. And what were Jesus' parting words to his followers, though? Let's look at some of the things that Jesus said. John 16, 33. Look at this. I have told you these things. I have told you these things. So that in me, you may have peace. Now in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So our worship team comes up. Amen. Amen. That same word is appropriate and timely and applicable to you and to our today. This, thank you, Father. I'm going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. There's going to be gas shortages. There's going to be rumors of war. There's going to be things that are going to happen in your life that are just going to feel so chaotic. But he said, I overcame all that. And even in that, you can have peace. Take heart. Thank you, God. Paul tells us that, God, you're going to help me. <laughs> if you need me to finish me, you're going to have to help me. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's so many people that they go through life. They don't know this. There's so many people that walk around without peace in their lives. That they go through the same things that you and I as Christ followers are going through. But there's no peace. Day and night, they try, but they, they read the books. The psychology books, the self-help. They go to counseling, and I'm not knocking any of those things. But I'm telling you right now, if that's the only thing you're doing, you're missing it. Because there is only one thing that can give true peace, and that's Jesus. And here's the thing is that he wants to give it to you as a gift. He's not trying to hold it back from you. He wants to give it to you. Paul tells us that this helmet is God's reminder of the finished work of Jesus that these same Christ followers had experienced years before at the cross. 
Jesus put on a crown of thorns so that you and I could wear a helmet called salvation. And every time you put on this helmet, every time you guard yourself up, it says this is your daily reminder that no matter what happens in life, no matter what chaos ensues, no matter what trouble comes your way, you are not fighting for victory. But because of Jesus, you will now stand in a position in victory. Oh, and that makes all the difference, saints. I'm not going in there trying to fight something. I've already won. I'm, it's solid. And, and we see this as just kind of a wrestling match between God and evil. And God and Satan, and like, like God is, is phased by this. God has already been, he defeated Satan at the cross. You are in victory. And I think about everything that we do go through and I think about all of our experiences and I've heard words used like, oh, these are disruptions. Disruptions in our lives. teachers, I felt like, you know, they just did that meant to torture us, right? If you're a teacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> but these pop quizzes were just random, like, you weren't ready for it. Like, you were just doing life, and all of a sudden, your teacher's like, boom, we're doing 100 questions today on algebraic equation. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's math. You know, like, I'm not ready. But they were to help the, they were designed to help gauge you on a subject to see how far along you had gone until the final test, until the one that really counts. And there is something that is coming that really counts. And that's part of the reason why I'm preaching so hard today, because there is something that is coming that really counts. I'm not fighting and I'm not preaching for glory. It doesn't matter that I'm here, but it absolutely matters why I'm here and who I'm here for. Matthew 25, 10 says, but while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in to the wedding banquet. But then the door was shut. What if every incident, every disruption, every chaotic moment in life is an opportunity to be the light to the world, the salt of the earth? What if God continues to just give us a little bit more time and a little bit more time to prepare for his return? Because guess what, y'all? He's coming back. Are you ready? We are putting on our armor for ourselves, for our families. But guess what? This armor... When it's on, it's bright, it's glowing, it also draws other people to him. What is it you got on? You got kindness on today? Look at that dude, he's so peaceful. How is that possible? He ain't got no money. Oh, I know their situation. I know what's going on in their lives. How do they hold themselves together? I promise you, people are watching your lives. They're watching your behaviors. They're watching your actions. And they're looking for you to reflect Him. Everything you do privately and publicly can draw people to Christ or lead them away from Him. And this is a serious matter. This is not something that we play with. Our Christian thinking and our Christian living is a serious matter. I want to close with this, though. These were the words to Paul the Apostle that Paul the Apostle finally shared to Timothy. And so Timothy was sent actually to Ephesus to deal with some matters within the church. He was a 
teenager. And so teenagers were entrusted, guys, to deal with church issues. Can y'all imagine a teenager running this church? I can, because I see it in the Word. And Philippians 4.13 tells me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'm not going to despise you because of your youth. Because I've seen it done in the Bible. But this is what he said. These are my parting words to you here today, church. Guard what has been entrusted to your care. Everyone say guard. We don't just give special things away, right? Like things that are near and dear to our heart, we don't just give it to anybody. But he says, guard what has been entrusted to your care. It's almost like holding my little girl. I ain't going to give her away to everybody. Especially like when COVID was happening, y'all, everybody was like, what are we doing? Are we touching you? What's going on? You know, fist bump, brother. I'm like, you know, I'm holding my baby like this, right? It's, we, we can't give the most special things just to everybody. But he says, this special thing, this baby, this thing called faith, everything that you've learned from, you know, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, from your mom, from your grandmother, Lois, like this has been entrusted to your care. So here's what you need to do with this. Turn away godless chatter. And all those opposing ideas, where do ideas permeate? In the mind of what is falsely called knowledge. Oh my gosh. Look at Paul just dropping the mic here. This stuff that everybody's talking about, they're calling it knowledge. As a Christ follower and as a warrior, he says, turn that away, man. You got nothing to do with this. But which some have professed his knowledge, and in doing so, they've departed from the faith. Church, I want to close with this. With all eyes closed, all eyes closed. I just want to have a, just a holy moment here today. I know there's Timothys in this house here today. I know there's young people in this house here today, but I, I know there's just people that are in this place here today that have just been struggling in their thoughts. The enemy has been having a field day in your mind, a field day in your mind. But I want to do something symbolically here today, but it's not just symbolism it is an act of faith because we're going to expose his lies but we're also going to stand in victory but if this is you where you've just been in the struggle place this last year and a half just hasn't been good to you mentally emotionally you don't know your left from your right sometimes if you're going in or you're going out if that's you and you need prayer here today if we need to expose some things here today would you just raise your hand all eyes closed. Hey, Raise what a hand. great time of worship and the word we had today. Thank you so much again for tuning in. If you gave your heart to Christ for the very first time, we want to know about it and we want to connect with you. And we have plenty of resources that we want to send you. So please go to our website and fill out a digital connection card. And so we can celebrate with you. And if you have a praise report or, or a prayer request, we want to know. So go ahead and fill out a digital connection card. We also want to let you know that there's multiple ways to give. And you can give online through our website, text to give, or even on our Rail map. So make sure you go online so you can give back to the kingdom so we can continue to make a huge impact locally and globally. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope you have a great week.